Watch Ernie, go, go, go. Car right, car right, car right, car right. Yeah, right. watch him, watch him, watch him, watch him. Damn it! Oh, yeah. Get ready. Dude, four f***ing heads up in that. Jeez. Right on the back wing. Can he make it happen? Yeah! Yeah! Push like hell. We got to stay in front of these guys. Both drivers on the push to pass. Contact in the pit lane. All right, sexy. Let that eagle fly. <laughs> Our outside, room behind you. No, clear outside. Good job. Just spun behind you. I don't know if you got him or not. He got out of it so hard. Look at these guys are all over the back. And throttle. And throttle. And throttle. <laughs> In and out lap. What's next? Come and get the checkers, big boy. Oh, baby, that was good. Inside, inside, outside, inside, outside. 2017 Verizon IndyCar Series. See what's next. Well, that's another Indy 500 in the books. Takuma Sato. Five years after losing the race on the final lap in 2012, wins the 2017 Indianapolis 500. What just happened here today? Takuma Saito wins. Fernando Alonso, well, he was good. He was strong the entire race long until his own new engine decided to be a bit more like that Formula One engine and a little bit less like that IndyCar engine. Chevrolet, they looked a little bit strong throughout the course of the day. Elliot Castroneves was so close to winning. However, damage that he got at the start of the minor race when he flew literally, quite literally, under Scott Dixon's car came back to haunt him at the end. It's RaceWatt TV. We have the entire gang here. Randy, what just happened? I think that was one of the most memorable Indy 500s in recent history, and will probably go down as the Indy 500 of this decade. Serious question first. Is that the catalyst that the Indy 500 needs to build itself for future years? Yes, this was, this in my opinion, this 500 had everything that you could ever ask for in a race, both positive and in some ways negative. You had the same usual names that you're used to in this championship turning up. Uh, you had rookies coming in and running strong You with Alonzo and Ed Jones. Ed Jones finishing third, fantastic run from him. Big memorable moments, both in on the racetrack and cars getting off the racetrack in fantastic fashion, most notably Scott Dixon. Overall, like I said, I think this is going to be the 500 of this decade. Well, let's start off with actually with the crash that happened with Scott Dixon. Paul Smith is here. Talk to him about that. Well, Paul, we didn't actually see the incident live. We saw it then on the multitude of replays that we saw. But it shows again that even though there are always going to be the Jackie Stewart's of the world that says Indy cars run too fast, Indy cars are too dangerous. No, it's not. Because Scott Dixon walked away from that crash. He did walk away from that crash. And it's just a testament to the level of safety that's gone into this car and to uh, the tracks as well. With things like the safer barrier and the catch fencing and uh, things like that. And... Uh, it was lap traffic just getting into the wall and uh well he certainly took flight that's for sure and uh that was a scary instant though and uh thankfully everyone was okay from that one even the photographer who was uh in the uh, stand uh, in behind the catch fence in there uh, he manages to uh, go away fine took a trip to the medical center but yeah scary scary moment and uh quite frankly uh, it's great to see that uh, he was able to just get up and uh, get out that car. Rani, thoughts about that? It was, I mean, it, it's one of the big indie incidents that you never want to see, is it? I mean, that was very, very close to Scott not basically getting out and walking out of that car. Um, you know, the, there's, there definitely 
was Scott's lucky. I'll say I'll just put it that way. Scott is lucky. Yes, the safety's very good, but uh, that was that was a scary incident. Um, really, the only incident I've seen, at least on an oval race, that has been anywhere close to that was Greg Moore's wreck. Uh, in terms of a car getting to the inside wall upside down, so how so, somehow, but yeah, very very scary crash uh, for Scott. But happy he walked away. And we've got Rachel Whiteford here as well. well. Rachel, you didn't see the first 50 laps of the race, but we were green the first 50 laps of the race. And again, even though there were more cautions than what we had in the last three or four years of this race, it didn't feel like a caution-heavy event. Certainly wasn't, no, Will. It, it, was, it, was, it felt actually low on the cautions for Indy, considering what we've seen recently. But to get a race to the end, it was actually managed by those cautions where we ended up having, rather than a long fuel run to the end of the race, we ended up being quite quiet and tactical like last year uh, with Rossi. This time, we got a race to the end of the Indy 500. And with five to go, we didn't know who was going to pick it from those top three or four cars. This was how the Indy 500 should be. And Rachel, it was a race to the end. I mean, there were other people that said last year, oh, Rossi only won the race because of the fact that, you know, he had the fuel mileage game. And well, I'm one of those people that will stand up and shout and say, well, Indy is as much of a fuel mileage game as it is anything else. But today it was a pure, unadulterated run to the flag. Yeah, it certainly was. And uh, with Chilton dropping back in those last couple of laps and, Helio and Sato coming through and to see Helio and Sato duke it out there. Two guys have been in this sport for quite a while and you know what? I would have been happy if either of them won, but what a battle we saw there. That was fantastic. It, everybody here was, we were all on the edge of our seats and that's what you want for the Indy 500, you know? That's the sort of spectator event really IndyCar needs, let's be honest. IndyCar needs more finishes like this. IndyCar needs more excitement. This was excitement. There's been disappointment, there's been craziness, but you know what? That does a lot, I think, for their standings. And Paul, I, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Randy. Is this the turning point now for the Verizon IndyCar series? Because, yeah, they had Kurt Busch a few years ago. Yeah, they had the 100th running of the Indy 500 last year, but the Fernando Alonso story really did send a shockwave, and... I'm not expecting Indy to just beat the Coke 600 in the ratings here today. I am expecting the Indy 500 to trounce the Coke 600 in the ratings. It, I would, I would, I would be shocked if uh, the Coke 600 actually uh, beats this today because that was absolutely spectacular and. Um, You've had so many people who don't normally watch IndyCar have paid attention to this event, mainly because of the Fernando Alonso effect. Just the, that name and that association with this event, a current Formula 1 driver, I can't remember the last time a current Formula 1 driver actually took part in this race. Um, it's that long ago, and to see how he was able to adapt himself to the car, adapt himself to oval racing, because he'd never done oval racing before, and really apply himself and to be able to push through and uh, lead some of the race as well, just goes to show that anybody who's got half half a talent in them and half a talent in their right foot will be able to go far in this. And uh, it just it also it, IndyCar have gained so much from this. You know, the, you look at the spectacle that they put on compared to Formula One, because of course there was the Monaco oh, Grand Prix God. this morning, and this is by far, this is what you show as an advert for what most sports should be. Not just in terms of the action on track, but the interaction with the crowd, with the, all the uh, ceremony that goes on with this event, and uh, the drama, the excitement, and the, the passion that everybody shows for this event. And it, it just goes to show that, you know, most sport isn't just Formula One. There is far much more more exciting and better uh, better marketed, better produced most sports than that. So uh, IndyCar, they've got to now push on and really take advantage of the momentum that this event has gained just through having Fernando Alonso associated with it. But you've got to remember, there's plenty of other uh, drivers involved in that that are saying, hey, hang on a second, I was in that race and we gave a hell of a show as well. Well, the interesting thing, Paul, is that you look back to the Monaco Grand Prix, and it's not me to slate the Monaco Grand Prix because, you know, it is one of the most historic race venues in the world. 
but you could count the number of overtakes that took place on two hands with a push. You could have done that in the first two laps of this Indy 500. And yes, it's a different type of track, different type of racing. And, you know, we saw the battles that the likes of um, Hamilton had throughout that race. The battle between Raikkonen and Alonso, for example. The strategy calls that went in there. But this race, I mean, I'm just having a look through. Three Formula, Formula 1 drivers in the top 10 in the Indy 500. But... Elio Castroneves, Ed Jones, a rookie, Tony Kanaan, Alexander Rossi, Marco Angetti, Gary Chavez, Carlos Munoz there inside the top 10. These are not day-to-day -day Formula 1 drivers. They've never stepped in an F1 car. Anyone, and I'm looking at you here, Mr. Lewis Hamilton, who <laughs> says that IndyCar racing is easy, needs to get their heads re-screwed, especially after today. Well, I mean, it's like uh, Lewis Hamilton with his comments basically um, being derogatory towards the IndyCar field. I'm sorry, but there are a lot of talented drivers out there who don't get the opportunity in Formula 1 because they don't have the budget. But do you know what? They get shown the opportunity to show that, hey, I've got talent as well and uh, I can really ply my trade in IndyCar. Look at Takuma Sato, ex-Formula 1 driver, never got an opportunity in a race-winning car. He's shown today that you know, he's won the biggest event in the month of May, um, quite frankly, <laughs> in terms of motorsport, because Monaco isn't the biggest event in May, it's this one. And also, it's worth noting here, Rachel, that Takuma Sato, as we said, he has been here before. 2012, he was one, well, three corners away, really, from winning that motor race. And we can remember the fantastic Japanese call from the 2012 event. And that was him versus Dario Franchitti. This race was no easier to win than in 2012, but Takuma Sato has spent four or five years since that event running an IndyCar, and for him, not only did the cards line in terms of him and his car, but the cards aligned in terms of him, the track, and his ability all into one. Absolutely. I mean, this was a, you know, a right place right time situation you know he had to work hard all race to get himself into that position to be there to, at the end to fight and you know what sato's always been one of those good drivers yeah we've all made fun now and again but it's always been that kind of well-meaning fun of you know we respect the guy because we've, there's been drivers in the past who we've kind of just completely said they're terrible but it's always been sato has always been a f real feature of indycar he's been a core component of it and you know what this was retribution of 2012 the, the mistake there what happened in that race and it cost him a lot this time he's just proved something to himself to his new team and to indycar he is still a huge threat and watch out rest of this year well, yeah, indeed so. And actually, in terms of um, Takuma Sato for this year, you've got to remember, there is more to this series than just the Indy 500. You've got to remember that because, of course, in one week's time, they are doing it all over again on ABC and ESPN for the Jewels in Detroit. So they go immediately from a super speedway to a very tough and difficult road course. We'll talk about that one, a streak circuit even. We'll talk about that one uh, a little bit later on here today. But we've gone a few minutes into this one. We've not fully yet talked about that Fernando Alonso situation. Well, Paul, he literally took the race lead out of nowhere, like a good old friend of ours, Randall Keith Alton. Yeah, he certainly did. Randolph uh, has given him the inspiration there. I don't know where Alonso to the front, and uh, he did. I'm glad I can be an inspiration. <laughs> but do you hear voices um, in your head? Your he <laughs> yes, yours. Uh oh. Oh dear. Um, right. Back to the subject. Um, Fernando, and do you know what? When he got out front, he looked like he belonged there as well in terms of that race and uh, really gave it some and uh, you know, he wasn't scared to uh, work with Alexander Rossi, his teammate. He wasn't scared to say, let's work together, let's uh, do a bit of fuel saving between each other and let's try and pull out a gap on the uh, guys behind, just swapping positions uh, quite a lot every couple of laps and, you know, that's... Um, that you know that that it just seemed to be that he he had adapted himself so quickly to that to that sort of nature of racing 
and uh, I've I've always been impressed with Fernando's talent, and uh, this is just another string to his bow. This this is um, he's he's got to he's got to come back. He has to come back yeah. to India, um, and if not, do a few more appearances in IndyCar as well. The thing for me is that you've got to put this event into perspective here, Randy, because yes, this is Fernando Alonso and we do recognize him as one of, if not the best pure racer in Formula One right now, you can put him in a top three echelon of maybe, um, the likes of Sebastian Vettel. Hi, race, what caps? And Sebastian Lola. <laughs> yeah. Uh, alongside Sebastian Vettel and Lewis Hamilton, but, we, we talked about it earlier, Will. That cat doesn't make a peep unless you go live. We didn't hear that cat during the entire race. We were on no. Team Beat the whole time. Start a podcast and Lola starts shouting. Yeah, but in terms of, of, of the actual race here today, you know, we are talking about one of the best pure races in F1 history of the last 25 years. But at the same time, we have got to remember that he was driving an Andretti. So, and Andretti have won the Indy 500 probably more than any other team in the last five years. Um, they've had, of course, those partnerships where they had that one with Dan Weldon, of course, in 2011. Um, they had that partnership again with um, Alexander Rossi last year. They've had it when they had their own driver, Ron Hunter Ray, run it a few years ago. But, you know, it's not as if we've just decided to put... Fernando Alonso into the slowest car. They've given him, arguably, in terms of Indy, the best package you can buy, maybe outside of Penske, but actually I would say even better than Penske. Penske wasn't really that impressive all month, so I mean, I, I would definitely agree. Being in, in an Andretti was probably the best team to be on, uh, except for, uh, I forget the name because I don't follow the series, except for uh, Ed Jones and Sebastian Bourdais. Those, I think, were the quickest cars, with most notably uh, Bourdais in qualifying. That may have been the team to be at, but then again, the Andretti cars were super strong all race long. Uh, the only Penske that really got itself near the front and was consistently there was... Uh, Castro Neves. Will Power was there and then he wasn't and then he was there and then him and uh, Montoya both got taken out in that late race wreck but it, it is an interesting situation because I don't think Fernando represents the Formula 1 grid as a whole. A lot of people are going to look at it and say the Formula 1 drivers are just on another level. Maybe someone like Fernando, maybe someone like Sebastian Vettel, maybe someone like Lewis but I think once you get away from that I don't think the talent level is nearly as large as a lot of people like to think it is. Is. Um, it'd be a, it'd be really interesting to see uh, Fernando pull a, uh, an Emerson Fittipaldi and race in the United States, sort of restart his career. Robin Miller mentioned that uh, uh, in an interview with Alonzo uh, during his uh, rookie test. It would be a lot of fun to see that happen. I will say, though, I think Alonzo might be at that point of his career where he's almost like Mon Mon Montoya in a way, where he can he's done enough. He might get away from the regular championship racing, and he might look to the big events of the world that he wants to compete in. Things like uh, the Monaco Grand Prix. Well, it's not easy to get yourself yeah. a ride there, but things like Indy, things like Le Mans. I think he's going to turn out for these big events, and we know that Alonso has put forth interest in doing GT and endurance racing, and I think this may have just gotten him very interested in at least showing up for another Indy 500. And I would actually say a year in IndyCar might do him a lot of good if he wanted to get the Triple Crown. And actually, Rach, we've got to go back and remember that the only reason, the only reason why Alonso is doing this is really because of the Treble Crown. It's not as if someone said to him, hey, we know McLaren suck right now. Do you fancy running in America? This is Alonso thinking about the big picture. He wants to be the first driver since Graham Hill to win the Treble Crown. And well, He's shown that he is capable of doing it because well, we've not seen him run an endurance car, so to say, but we know he's going to be good. And I would always argue that if it came down to it, you know, the first time out, you find a McLaren to put him in. But realistically, you're looking to put him in a Porsche and have some form of a deal. And I've always said, have some form of a deal where you get Montoya and Alonso guaranteed the opportunity if they both win two legs of the travel ground where they can essentially compete for the opportunity to win that third leg yeah that would be fantastic it really would be to see those two going for that and alonzo is such an experienced driver will is such a fantastic racer seeing him in top flight equipment again 
and I'm going to be brutally honest about this as a past Formula 1 fan, um, to see Alonso in top flat equipment again was seeing a different Fernando Alonso. He was inspired again. He looked aggressive and passionate out on track because he had a car that could compete at the front. And seeing Alonso at the front of a race again, am I the only one that saw that was fantastic? Because you know what? I would He's say had one a terrible thing, couple of years. He wasn't, he was aggressive, but he wasn't overtly aggressive. He was making moves when he had to make moves, but he, he was didn't veteran aggressive. Stick that, yeah, he didn't stick the car down to the inside because he had to. And I think that's what showed him out as being so good. I mean, you look at some drivers that has come and competed in the Indy 500 in years past, that make some stupid moves, and Alonso didn't do that. All he did is, I mean, you actually saw he was actually rather reserved. In that entire race. Well, I think it was when he was trying to overtake one of the Penty cars about two thirds of the way into the race. It took him a long time to do so. It took him a while to get past the number 27 car. It took him a while to get himself to the front of the field. Well, that's passing at Indy is a hard thing to do anyway. But, you know, I think he was being patient with it. You know, it's the veteran sort of um, aggression that he needed. You know, he knew, knew when to go for it, he knew when not to go for it. And I think just because it's a new sport to him and over racing's new to him, I think he picked it up fairly quickly. But as a racing driver, he knew when he needed to be where. You know, he knew it was the race of strategy and fuel. That's something that he's very familiar with. And honestly, I think, you know, he really enjoyed the challenge. And I think he enjoyed being in there, getting involved, getting stuck in with it. And it was great to actually see that sort of performance. Um, you know what? My heart broke when that Honda popped. And I think I'd made a quip a couple of laps before it did so. I've, I've seen about six Hondas pop their engines at that point. I think I made a joke that, tell you what, if his engine blows in this one, he's probably just going to put a gun in his mouth and pull the trigger. And then his engine blew. So At least he didn't put a gun in his mouth. Yeah, at least he didn't, because I'd have felt really bad if that had happened. But, I mean, I, I, was, I meant to basically, to clarify my point, was I meant that, God, he must... Feel, he, will, he probably will feel like crap if it goes here as well. You know, why me? Sort of moment. You know, yeah, he'll go full. Um, what's his face? Um, Rutgers Kev. Why me? Yeah. I, I will say one thing as well. It's ironic because no McLaren actually finished in the greatest weekend worth of racing here, Randy. Yeah. And that's really coming away from this i don't think that's anything that mclaren would have wanted to take away from this uh, i mean i mean grant i think i think overall mclaren had a good bit of marketing this weekend you had fernando run strong you had jensen button make it into q3 at monaco you had some good storylines there uh, and then you also had the little bit of uh, banter interaction between button and alonzo before the monaco race but at the same time the fact that none of the cars finished the race the way they did that has to be a bit of heartbreak for those guys um I don't know. It's 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 a tough one right now that McLaren and Honda find themselves in because they're such an interesting team. They have such interesting drivers, uh, and they could potentially branch out anywhere. There's been talks of a McLaren GTE car. There's been people saying that a McLaren prototype will would be really cool to see. There's been you know Lonzo we know wants to get in GT cars, showing interest in Indy cars. McLaren could do a lot of interesting things right now, but they have to play their cards closer to chest. And I think the mo the one thing they need to do is they need to figure out their Formula One reliability first, and then I think branch out. Live from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, it's Cisco Scaramuzzi, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, Cisco. Hello. Okay, yeah. Indy 500. Your perspective. You were there. What happened? Well, I think the place to start off with was, you know, Rachel just got over talking about Alonzo Pop and the motor. And I mean, there was every, I mean, everyone cried out on the grandstand when it happened. I mean, we were all sitting up. I was up in turn four. I'd been kind of roaming around during the race. And as soon as it happened, everyone looked up towards the video boards, saw the orange 29 and just audible cries out from the audience. Everyone was devastated and it really kind of set the tone and everyone realized, wow, this is going to be just an all out brawl to finish. And that's really what it was. And talk about the race in the, I want to talk about bits of the race. And of course, you saw pre-race festivities. Um, Jim Connolly, you said, what do you think about him in terms of back home again? Well, I mean, you have to keep in mind, Will, I'm a, I'm a Chicagoan. So, you know, <laughs> I've seen him perform, you know, the national anthem uh, for the Blackhawks. I've seen him do it at, at Chicagoland uh, during the NASCAR race. To have him here is just fantastic. And 
because he's an IU grad and everything like that, I think it was really a perfect choice. Do you think he could be in a new full-time role? I would, I would be pretty happy with that if he was going to do that. I mean, you know, talk about one of the most iconic voices in sports right now as far as singing goes. And then you think back to the race itself. And again, we saw that horrible moment there down at turn number two. We're going to talk about a bit more in detail in the studio in a couple of moments' time in terms of uh, Scott Dixon, Jay Howard, and of course you had um, the driver of uh, Helio Castroneves literally going right underneath that. What was the, the situation with the fans when that crash happened? Well, it's interesting because I had stepped away and I was down. I was down below the grandstand, and it, you could hear the cars just careen. And suddenly, everyone just gets up. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? I was kind of by the start finish line at one point when they started showing the replays, and just everyone was just shocked. And I remember I had uh, the production the production feed of the TV. Uh, of the TV audio on my scanner and just I hear Eddie Cheever come over over the radio he's like Dixon I just can't I just can't and the TV produ production uh, crew just goes I know I know and at one point later on he's just going we should be celebrating the fact that he was able to walk away from that because it was scary it was and we'll talk about that one in a moment's time as well but the last couple of the laps of the race that last and final restart then to Kumasato getting himself what many felt he lost in 2012. What do you think? Uh, and I was, I had James Pike on the phone. I was texting with him current, kind of during that final group. He's right now in the, uh, he's in the media center over in Concord and Charlotte right now. But I'm texting him and I'm like, I don't know, that 26. I mean, we know, we know something crazy needs to come. And he texts me, he's like, yeah. If there's anyone who's going to be ballsy enough to make that pass on Chilton, it's probably going to be the 26. And sure enough, he made it work. I thought Elio waited. I think he went too soon. If he had waited a little bit longer, he might have had something. But, I mean, how can you script it? I mean, Takuma Sato, you know, the former F1 driver, we heard so much about, you know, Fernando Alonso, the current F1 driver, coming over, and it's a former F1 driver to bring home the victory. I mean, that's that's pretty cool right there. So sort of ironic, don't you think? Oh, definitely. And I mean, you know, talk about Andretti just the last couple of years here at IMS, you know, Ryan Hunter Ray, Alexander Rossi, and, and now Takuma Sato. I mean, they've got their program figured out. And I mean, to see Michael as happy as he was, and when Takuma got out of the car, everyone in the crowd was cheering. I did not see, at least from what I was seeing in turn four, I did not see very many disappointed fans. I saw people, you know, sad that Elio didn't win, but Takuma Sato, I think, is one of those guys where, you know, he gets the win. And I think everyone can understand what that means to him and it's ultimately a pretty cool deal final question do you think the fact that andressi has been so successful with rossi with ryan hunter and if you go back and have a think about 2011 with that driver of dan weldon do you think this starts to ease the pain over the fact that again a third generation indycar talent in uh, marco andressi has not yet been able to crack the big one and I mean, you know, we talk about he hasn't been able to crack the big one. We barely even saw him all day. I mean, you know, saying up, I had the scanner on TV production, the PAs. Rarely did I hear his name come up. And it's I have to wonder what's going on with the 27. And at some point, you know, are they going to be able to are they going to be able to go over that hump? And is Marco going to be able to come through? I mean, the Andretti curse at Indianapolis, it's still very much in play. Well, thank you so much there, Tiscus Garamuza, live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And that is one of the points we're going to touch on in the next couple of moments or so. But first, Randy, let's go back to the crash, Scott Dixon. Um, and we had the opportunity of watching this race together. And we saw that incident, again, as everyone did on TV, not live, but on the replay. And the first time we saw it, we thought... Oh, my word. Then the second, third time we saw, we realized just how serious an incident that was. And again, if Scott Dixon was even 90 degrees rotated from where he was, we could be having a very different conversation right now. Yeah, that was... 
that was the crash open wheel fans american open well oval open wheel fans that's the that's the crash you get scared of i mean even on road courses the big worry is that the car gets upside down and the cockpit lands somewhere near that top edge of the wall that's that's when things get really scary um of course, the incident started with Jay Howard getting into the wall. Not, I actually forget whether or not he broke or whether he, he just straight up made a mistake and got into the wall exiting one. Dixon really nowhere to go. And, I mean, from there, he was just airborne. Um, I'm sure there'll be some safety questions arisen from this. But in my opinion, it's almost an unsolvable problem of how do you make an open wheel car safer when it comes to those sort of car, uh, contacts. You can talk about perhaps closing the top of the car but there's always arguments that come up about escaping from fire and the like uh it's it, it's a very difficult solution to, uh problem to come up with a solution with just more or less happy that dixon pretty much unharmed got up and out of the car and you've got to say as well we are so glad here randy the fact that they do have safer barriers on the inside of the track here ims as well as on the outside and that's just smart. I mean, it, you know, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, a lot of people like to think it's NASCAR that came up with the safer barrier. This safer barrier invented at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. That's why you see it pretty much around the entirety of the racetrack. You see it in the corners. It's not there down the straightaways, though. But, I mean, it, it definitely helps. Uh, I, I'm not actually sure whether or not it affected this crash very much because the way he hit, he kind of got up into the fence. And it, it was actually a bit of a glancing blow in some respects to the wall with the way the car shattered. I actually think in some ways, even if the safer barrier hadn't been there, it would have been a harder impact to the car. But I think the car would have just disintegrated the way it did even more so. Uh, but the way he hit, I'm not. I don't know if the safer barrier did or didn't help. Um, granted, we'll just we'll just assume it was a good thing. But uh, it was it's still scary, scary incident. And Paul, 20 minutes is what it took for him to replace a catch fence and get back to green flag racing. I mean, that's yeah. insane. Uh, that, and that's a testament to the organisation and uh, the fast, quick work actions of the uh, the track workers there at uh, Indianapolis to be able to take a serious safety, you know, safety thing of the catch fencing, be able to take a completely ruined part of that safety uh, catch fencing and replace it in that sort of time frame is, you know, hats off to them. That is quick work. They obviously have plans in place for that type of incident and to have the uh, the the materials ready at hand to be able to just get in quick action, get the job done, and get the race going again. Absolutely fantastic to see that. And uh, fortunately, we didn't need any more stoppages in the race. Yeah, we almost thought there. Alvin Nieves is here on Race Spot TV. We almost thought Alvin that with the four or five crash we had towards the end of the race, that was going to be red flag. And I was very good at predicting the red flag at the first caution. Wasn't so good at saying it's going to be a red flag the second time around because we did say in the yellow. Well, you know, it. I think the whole reason that we had a red flag at the first incident is, is because the how vicious the first incident was that perhaps we were scared that there, that there was a life-threatening life-threatening situation that happened there whereas the second crash yes it, it, it was a five-car crash and all that but when you look at the crash it, it itself it didn't look like nobody was, could be seriously hurt on the you know just looking at it so i think that is why we saw that red flag at first because perhaps we we could be dealing with something that was life threatening. Fortunately, Scott Dixon was able to walk away from it, and you know that's something that we have to talk from uh, from motorsports overall. You know, we always talk about you know making things safer, 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 and I have to say that while you can make things safer, there is no way that you can make things 100% safe because you know. The human body itself is not designed to crash at 200 miles an hour. You know, there's no going around it. No matter how many improvements you make to it, there is no way that you can eliminate the fact that the human body cannot withstand an impact like that. You can reduce the probability of suffering a severe injury, let alone a fatality. But no way that you can make it 100% that you can get rid 100% of it. And the drivers... No matter the series that they go, where is the fastest series, uh, where, which we saw today in Indy, or is the slowest series, say, in MX-5 Cup, you know that there is always a risk. So you go into the car knowing that 
something can happen, but the equipment that you have with you can do the best job at preventing the and the and the most possible to you having an injury. Yes, some things can happen and like like you just mentioned, if the car was rotated uh, 90 degrees of further to the front, we could be talking about a different story. That is absolutely true. But, you know, there is that is something that we cannot uh, predict. You know, what if this happens, this happens. Because if you think about it, some always something will happen that if you want to make it 100, 100% safe, then make the cars drive by, make the cars drive themselves and to be honest that is the last thing we want to see yeah we lost some big names in this year's indy 500 as well scott dixon sage Karam, ryan hunter ray charlie kimball fernando alonso will power the mayor of hinchtown james hinchcliffe oriel servia and also joseph newgarden a bad day here today randy for team penske once again i mean i'm having a look down through the field and well Montoya came home P6, Elia Castroneves in P number two. Rest of their I cars. Even... I mean, that's not a good day. That's in no way a good day for Roger Penske. I don't think it was just a bad race. They just flat out had a bad month of May. They only had one or two cars get into the fast nine and qualifying their multiple cars outside the top 15. I think down near the bottom 30 even. I mean... Penske, they, they didn't get it quite right. I'm sure having the Chevy engines didn't really help. We knew that the Hondas were the fastest engines, I mean, really since a couple weeks ago. Those Hondas were bad fast all month in practices, in qualifying, and then in the race. I mean, they, the, the Hondas basically dominated at the front of the field. Really, the only couple Chevys we saw getting anywhere competitive was pretty much Will Power and Helio Castroneves, and Helio almost got a chance at winning that race. We'll talk about, I'm sure, some moves that happen at the end as we get further down, but Chevy in general, not a great month. It was just, I mean, outside of Ed Carpenter and J.R. Hildebrandt in qualifying, as well as uh, Helio Castroneves in the race, it was, I'd say for the bow ties, a very, very disappointing month of May. Yeah, and you actually look at the top 10, and it is... Honda dominated with one, two, three, four, five, six there inside your top 10, including the race win, and four drivers inside of your top five. Worth noting, though, Rachel, as well, that, you know, some drivers had an up-and-down day as well outside of that. Ed Carpenter, for example, started the race with what we thought was silly string on the outside of that Fozzie Chevrolet, and, well, eh is the only thing I can say for his motor race. Yeah, that was definitely one that uh, was... There's been some interesting moments during that race, and that was one of them, especially losing half your wing. I mean, that's a fun one. And I forget the car that had the wing that decided to go wobbling horrendously, and that was the luckiest save of the entire Probably race. More than a uh, panacotta. Who was that car, Will? The one with we the wiggly wing. We will remember it. I know exactly. I know the car in terms yeah. of its graphics. But either way, car with horrendous wiggly, wiggly wing. Uh, it had broken after running into the back of somebody, and uh, clipped a side pod. This wing was was wobbling back and forth more than you know certain political parties' foreign policies. But it's honestly, he was. You know, it was like you've got to pit this time. You've got to replace your wing. Okay, I'll stay at one more lap. Caution flies because. Uh, car decides to basically pound the outside wall so lucky is save of the race in terms of getting a free pit stop it was indeed as well also um we have got ourselves jack styles here having a look a little bit further up the field we were thinking at the end of this motor race that max chilton could have got himself his first indy 500 win but he fell back dramatically in that last restart I mean, Max Chilton, that would have been a great result for him had he finished, had he won the Indy 500 day. Uh, first Brit since, I think, would have been Jim Clark to Oi! win the Indy 500. Oi! Uh, Mr. Weldon, Oi! perhaps? Oh, yeah, Mr. Weldon. No! Oh, just just oh, kick no! him. He's gone. My, He's my gone. Indie, my no. Indy history. Dario Frank good, Kitty, so. 2012. Will DLL That's not working. But, um, it would, I mean, if Max Chilton had a one here today, that would have been brilliant. But, obviously, it wasn't him, wasn't for him that day. He... He obviously just lost a bit of pace in the final few laps. Helio and um, Helio and Takuma were clearly too good, and Takuma obviously just that little bit better than Helio to come onto victory lane today. So it's a bit of a shame for Max Chilton. Obviously, we would have liked to have seen a Brit winner, but it doesn't all play out like that. So well done to Takuma. Obviously, a great win for him. He should have done it in 2012 probably. But 
Uh, Max Shilton, he had good pace there, holding the lead for a long time. And I think the caution has just helped him slightly with fuel strategy as well. And also we're keeping that lead with the constant cautions of people just being able to not keep it out of the wall coming through the first two corners after a restart. For the record, in 2012, Daniel Franchitti won the race by beating <clears throat> some driver called Takuma Sato. And in 2011, of course, some driver in the number 98 winning West Machine, known as Dan Weldon, one after J.R. Hildebrand crashed in the final corner of the final lap of the motor race. Nigel Mantle, for those asking, did not win the iRacing uh, Indy 500. The iRacing Indy 500. He never won the iRacing Indy 500. And he certainly will say never won the Indy 500. As came well. close. He did. He did Couldn't come serve. close. Was that and in actually, 91? 93. 93. 93. 93. And actually, Paul, we were wondering about comparisons between Nigel Mansell and Fernando Alonso. Because actually, the things that Nigel Mansell fell flat at, Fernando Alonso wasn't too bad at. And that was pit stops and restarts. Yeah, uh, you could tell that Fernando had worked a lot um on his pit stops i mean we saw him with that initial test that he had in Indy that they were placing tires right at the edge of the uh proceeding and uh and the following pit stalls just so he could get used to having to swing the car in to his pit stall and then to power out of it to kick the car out of that pit stall so he didn't collect anybody so he took a lot of practice doing that and he also did a lot into a uh, He's had little bits of practice with you know restarts. They do a little bit in Formula One, but it's a completely different thing with Formula One in terms of the restarts that they do there. Um, but really, he didn't look out of place too much. Maybe the the first the, you know the start of the race, he he was a little bit caught out with that, and uh, the first restart as well was caught out. But he seemed to cotton on pretty quick um, of his ability to be able to pick that up as he went along. So uh, definitely uh, he showed a lot more than Nigel Mansell did, but we all remember that Nigel Mansell famously would do half a day's testing and then would go off to the golf course. So um, <laughs> that, that was his approach to testing, uh, well, whereas Alonso would have been really... Cars. That was on track. That was his way of getting rid of all the Ganassi cars, trying to hit them whilst he was on the golf course on the inside. <laughs> yeah, possibly. Um, but, you know, this is... Um, you know, this is, this is what... Um, yeah, this is this is what we expect from Fernando. He's a he's a true professional, and he will have done so much research and so much uh, intense preparations for uh, this event. And yeah, it was uh, good to see him out there. And unfortunately, yeah, as we said, we've already said that um, engine just letting him down. Yeah, so Fernando Alonso's engine went a little bit like it's alive the track going tick tick boom. However, Takuma Sato was a driver who, let's be honest, Randy. We didn't pay much attention to him throughout the first 160 laps of the motor race, but it's worth noting that the top 10 really did start at the front of your shield here today. We didn't see too much movement. When you take cautions out of the way, those guys that started well, they finished well here today. Yeah, that was, I think, one of the big stories of the race as well. I mean, you talk about that first 100 or so laps. Really, we got a caution somewhere with around 80 or 90 to go, which kind of split the strategy. And a lot of the front runners came down pit road, but half the field stayed out. That's why we ended up with the likes of Max Chilton out there in the front. Um, you know, but for the most part, the cars that were near the front at the start of the race were there at the end of the race. And not a lot of people fell back early. The only, really, I think the only person who qualified up near the front that wasn't there halfway it was Scott Dixon. Yeah, indeed. So, and actually, Dixie did work his way through the field quite a bit. And actually, um, after Scott Scott's qualifying on pole, falling down, working himself back up. And well, for Ganassi here today, Randy, I mean, they let's not forget, last year, even though they didn't win the Indy 500, they won the 24 Hours of Le Mans. So, they had themselves that big marquee win. Now... All of a sudden, that pressure is on the four GTs once again for this year to get that big marquee win. Yeah, I mean, Ganassi in general has stepped up their game on, on all fronts. You've had Kyle Larson have a good year in the Monster Energy Series. The Fords and the likes of Weck and Imza are the Fords. And, you know, of course, coming out with that Lamar win, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, 
fantastic by the Ganassi guys that they've been so strong. And uh, let's not turn this into a uh, Lamaze in like three weeks podcast. But who can uh, who can really wait? But I mean, the the, the Ganassi cars they were pretty much good all day. You do know that the entire broadcast have forgotten who Jonathan Buchel's name even was. That's yeah, that's fair enough. Fair enough. It's it's. Memorial Day weekend. I'm allowed. We've to... summoned him now. He'll come. We'll literally okay. watch Patel show up in the podcast chat in a couple of seconds because he'll be there. And he'll just talk about Le Mans. It'll be fine. Um, I would say one of a couple of things as well. Um, the cautions they dictated strategy a little bit, Paul, but not too much here today. And <laughs> you saw some drivers on the alternate strategy. It, it wasn't so important. It wasn't like the years that we've seen previously. Yeah, I mean, we saw with the um, with the cautions, it just seemed to come nicely timed for some some main pit stops. But we saw a lot of green flag pit stops as well, so uh, it was really good to to see how that came in, and you could really see the effect of how uh, drivers were able to push going into pit road and coming out of pit road as well. So we had that good mixture of green flag pits and also the caution pits as well. So um, Really good. A few teams struggling to get the the fuel nozzle in as well. So um, a few issues for a few of them. So uh, you know yeah, what? Rossi. They, were, they, they had issues last year as well. Don't forget. Yeah, uh, but it wasn't just Rossi, was it though? That uh, had the well. I think well. I think Rossi's going to come away when we're talking about that issue as the big loser in that respect. Because Rossi had a very very fast car today. A running top five all race long had that mistake on pit lane, and he goes from fighting. You know, for the race lead, yeah, with the strategy, he would have been about 10th to 12th, but he got shuffled back to somewhere around 20th, and he really didn't recover from that in the last 80 or so laps. Well, I mean, you look at him, he ended up finishing 7th in the race there. So well, but that was also... The, but that shows to show the pace that he had in the car as well. Well, and but that's also after through. that five-car incident that yeah. took out four or five cars as well. Otherwise, you know, those guys are still there. Does Rossi end up in the top 10? Maybe they had that car super trimmed out because he was able to keep it up front. But it was... It was... That was, I think, a heartbreaking moment for Rossi, and that moment is what I think took away his chance at winning that race. Yeah, okay, he, so he had a really good shout there. Start with disappointment of the day then. Rachel, I'm going to come to you first. I think it's a pretty easy one. My disappointment of the day is Alonso. You see, no, 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 no. You really had a call. Fernando Alonso, your disappointment of the day after. Yeah, well, no, my, dis my personal tired, disappointment, tired as in I was but... disappointed for him to retire, no, was my point. What she, mean, my what she means is Honda engines. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I mean... sorry. Honda engines were the disappointment of the freaking day. That's for darn sure. But, you know, if, if in terms of my disappointment, in terms of if I expected a better performance, um, honestly, I can't think of anything other than perhaps Chevrolet. Okay. In general. Over to you then, Paul. Um, I, I'm going to trigger Will Vincent right now. Um, oh, dear. Ladies and gentlemen, my disappointment of the day is Buddy Lazier. Hey. <laughs> Actually, let's talk about that in a bit more detail because should the likes of Buddy Lazier, Jay Howard, etc., who are there just to make up the numbers, I mean, I know in a situation right now where you don't get the 40, 50 drivers qualifying for the Indy 500 like you had in years previous that eliminated this BS. But should you have a field of 33 cars when you know that Buddy Lazier is going to be one of these drivers? Well, well, who was it that we heard was getting the uh, the uh, hurry up? It was uh, uh, Piggott, wasn't it? Yeah. He was getting the hurry up as well in that race. Um, ended up five laps down. To, um, five laps, six laps down. Sorry, uh, in the race there for him. You've got to look at it, and with a with a track like this as well, you have to have everybody at a certain pace. And quite frankly, really, we need to maybe relook at reevaluate how we go about doing that, and have a qualifying where you have to qualify to just get into the event. I agree in that one. Actually, I think the biggest disappointment for me of the month. Did Andy Car just go past Paul's window? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that, that's, or that's... a Vauxhall Corsa with a huge exhaust. Vauxhall Nova, please. That one of the biggest <laughs> disappointments for me of the month of May has been the lack of having 33 cars to take the green flag here this uh, this this afternoon. Randy, what about you? Um. Well, I don't want to go with an easy one. Everyone's, of course, going to say Alonzo. 
Um. God. I'll say Dixon. I'll say I'll say Dixon getting taken out by a backmarker was a huge disappointment because Scott was super fast, obviously coming away with the pole. First 50 laps, he fell back a few spots, and I'm sure some adjustments could have gotten made to that car. He would have, you know, been somewhere near the front near the end when it counted. I think that was definitely a big one. And also Helio just coming up, you know, the other one I would choose if I had to is Helio just coming up that little bit short again, as awesome as it is to see Takuma win, uh, seeing Helio get his fourth would be amazing. With Elio, of course, looking to join that club with Rick Mears, et al. And we hear it all the time. In Indy car racing, every time the month of May comes on, it's will Elio get himself that fourth Indy 500 win? It's actually worthwhile thinking here that he is by far the most accomplished driver, Randy, to win three Indy 500s, but not four. Helio Castroneves, if you look at the numbers, is, in my opinion, the best driver to ever run at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway ever. He's oh, better no, than no. Foyt. He's better than Mears. He's I'm better sorry. than anyone else to no, have no, ever no, run no, there. I disagree. Danny Weldon. Because you look at Dan Weldon's average result, and I think it was 2.8. Did he run as many years as Elio has? It doesn't matter. He ran enough years. He won of course it No, no. He ran 2,000 and, and I've got to get these years right in my head. But I think he ran 2004 through 2011. Now, let's be honest. It's not Dan Weldon's fault that he stopped running the Indy Oh, right, 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 right. I'm not, I'm not saying he's, he's not, but I'm saying that I think in that the, the potential... In the years that Dan Weldon ran the Indy 500, he had a better average finish than any other driver who had run more than five years. Um, and let's not forget, he came home second two years in a row before he won the 2011 Indy 500. Now... Elio is on that level by getting so close so many times, but I would say that you've got to consider that Weldon's wins, I mean, the 2011 win didn't come in a competitive car. The 2005 win, yes, he was at Andretti, yes, whoever went his way, it helped. The 2009, 2010 second places came in a Panther car, for Christ's sake, a Panther car. But Elio has been in a Penske his entire time. You always expect him to be top five coming into a 500. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's definitely true. But I think the fact that you expect him speaks to the fact that he's been so good, been so consistent. And I mean, I'm not saying Dan isn't a very close runner-up to potentially that award. But I think Helio, considering he's had the opportunity to run longer, he started two years earlier than Dan and he's gone on six years uh longer as well so you're talking about closer to 15 years as opposed to six and dan is or helio rather is consistently in the top 10 this is his third second place finish and he has three wins half of his races he's out of you know decade and a half he's finished in the top two i think helio is the obvious answer for best driver in indianapolis ever i would i would ask the question knowing the fact that dan Warden was going to go to andretti motorsports knowing the fact how good and dreading motorsports have been the last five years does that play any factor into your thinking it's it's such a hard one to say because you know we we're not talking about Andretti's, Andretti's, Andretti here. well I mean, right I, well right that's that's but that's the thing is is and at the same point, you can also mention the fact that a lot of times luck has to be on your side one of, of course one of Dan's races Honestly, he, he came away with a very lucky win. Yeah. It's a very memorable win. One of the most iconic wins in Indianapolis Motor Speedway history. But, but at the end win. of the day, it was a very lucky win. You think of a lot of the other drivers that have won recently. You think about Sato. You think about Hunter Ray. You think about a lot of the other drivers that have won in recent years. A lot of those aren't coming off the back of lucky wins. They're coming off the back of putting themselves in the right place, the right time, putting it all on the line, and getting it done. But at the same time, and I'm not going to talk about Dan Weldon here. Are you? Uh, would you then for call Penske or Andretti the best team at Indy over the last 20 years? Oh, that's so hard to actually predict. Um, Penske. Penske is one of those teams that. I think everyone is going to expect to be there, I think, longer. I think Andretti might be on a bit of a hot flash in the last few years. 
Uh, so Andretti, as good as they are, I think there's going to be a point where they maybe falter. Of course, going into the next season, we're expecting a new 2018 chassis. Everything's going to be up in the air. It's basically going to be an etch a sketch. Um, but I, I think Penske. Penske is definitely the best team to have ever been in Indianapolis by far. So if you look at it over a 20-year window, it has to be Penske 100%. Okay, so to wrap things up a little bit then, um, Takuma Sate, Paul, does get his first Indy 500 win. Now, the conversation coming into this event was F1 legitimacy in IndyCar. Now, Fernando ran top 10 most of the race. Takuma Sato wins the event. Let's not forget, and I will be honest, it took him six years to get there. But how do you think this will do in terms of the F1 appeal to IndyCar moving forward? I, I think people should take notice and um, with this in terms of Formula 1. As we said earlier, it, this has brought so many eyes from that Formula 1 fan base who maybe are just sort of like purely, oh, F1's the only thing. You know, it's brought so many eyes, and it's brought so many names that people will recognise from Formula 1, say, like a Takuma Sato, Max Chilton, Juan Pablo Montoya, you know, we've not really mentioned him much, uh, Alexander Rossi, you know, so people like that, those names that have been in Formula 1, that just gets, you know, people sort of going, oh, right, okay, so it's not just Fernando who's, who's taken part who's been in Formula 1. So, uh, really, that's... Uh, an interesting way of looking at it and as I said earlier I really hope that one uh, quite a lot of Formula 1 fans see IndyCar as the spectacle that it is and that two that IndyCar can say right hopefully they've got a plan behind the scenes to say right we've got all this attention now we need to hit while the iron's hot let's get push on marketing wise uh, really getting the name out of the sport uh, of the competition and really sort of market the next event, which is, of course, is in Detroit in a week's time. Um, I don't know if Cisco will have some final words so about this sort of uh, thing of bringing Formula One fans into this, but I know he's got a few words to say, that's for sure. Cisco? Cisco, this is your chance. Don't waste it. Hello? Hello? <laughs> Hello, Cisco. I'm being buzzed by a chopper right now. Hold on. <laughs> this what is what we say? get. He's getting buzzed by a chopper. So uh, this is what you get when we've got a live link up he's to lying. somebody he's who's on the ground. Pit. Yeah. He's just got a hot number to a higher girls. Okay, so I was going to try and butt in for biggest disappointment. I'm going to have to go with Chevrolet, just down to the fact that you come in as a separate manufacturer, and we're kind of seeing something similar to what kind of is happening to Toyota. You know, they put so much money and advertising into it, and I mean, you know, JGR has been decent this year. NASCAR, not really, not really the dominance. And I'd say similar to Chevrolet and IndyCar. You know, they put, you know, they have the pay all the official vehicles, all Chevrolet. They had a big old booth today in the infield. And uh, yeah, that turn out for them. I mean, what did you say, Will? Top six was all Hondas. Well, um, we had well, also Helio. The top true, ten. Yeah. Um, we had one in the top five being a Chevrolet. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. Elio did a great job, but I kind of expect that out of them. And, you know, I expect Chevrolet, I kind of expect better out of them, considering they don't have to worry, you know, all they have to worry about is Honda. And, I mean, this is something we've seen crop up before, you know, 2014. The questions were, you know, what happened to Honda? You know, suddenly Chevrolet was all over the place. And it's kind of that back and forth. So I'm going to have to go with Chevrolet on that. But overall, just to wrap things up, I mean, it was an incredible event. And... I, I really wasn't sure going into this because it's the 101st. You know, we didn't know. Was it going to be, and certainly it's not as big as a crowd as it was last year, but still a very decent crowd. Everyone was very supportive. And, I mean, at the end of the day, it was, it was just a lot of fun. Well, disappointment to best performance of the day, Cisco, before we let you go. Was that best performance? Yep. Best performance, I'm going to say Max Chilton because he impressed the heck out of me because with that last kind of caution when we were coming to green with about 11, 12 to go, um, 
you know, they were saying, you know, part of part of the TV production crew, they're like, well, no one's been able to touch him. And he really sat out there. I mean, he finished decently while he missed the podium, but, you know, for Max, that was, I believe, his second race here at Indy. And I, at the end of the day, he had a really good run, and he looked really strong out there. It's just experience trumped him. Did what we lose Will? Interrupt things up then. Performance of the day. Performance oh. of the day. Hmm. That's a tough one. Um, I would say Ed Jones, another rookie, a rookie who had practically no expectations because all the attention was on that rookie of the number 29 of Fernando Alonso. And Ed Jones has come in, done a fantastic job, finishing third place there in his first Indianapolis 500. Absolutely fantastic. He's been my performance of the day. What about you, Andy? I wasn't going to say Ed Jones because I expected someone to take the easy one, and I don't want to take the easy one either, but I'm going to have to say Helio Castroneves. I mean, Chevrolets, we know we're down on power. We know the Penske, Penske cars were struggling for pace all month. They weren't really, none of them, with the exception of Helio, looked like they had any chance at the win whatsoever. And most notably, Helio did what he did and made the aggressive moves that he did after driving underneath scott dixon and that's the way that incident worked out that could have rattled even the most experienced of drivers i think helio helio i think drove fantastically today i think drive of the race has to go to him uh but alonzo as well imp it's super impressive well that's all we've got time for then i i'm gonna agree with um paul on that one um and i would say that overall there's been many, many performances of the day. But what Paul said is the one that I will agree with as we are going to say goodbye. Don't forget the jewels in Detroit are next week. On ESPN. First race streaming live on BT Sport 3. The second race on BT Sport ESPN in the United Kingdom. Thank you so much then to everyone. To Rachel Whiteford, to Paul Smith, Jack Stiles, Ronnie Chenneth, Alvin Nieves, Cisco Scaramuza. This has been post-race coverage from the 101st Indy 500. Thank you so much for joining us. It's still May. We might have done milk, but Charlotte, that is coming up next.